To get the entire episode and all our content, look for a podcast of Biblical Proportions on all podcasting platforms. Hello everybody and welcome to a podcast of Biblical Proportions. Episode 18, The War of the Nine Kings. Up to now we discussed the adventures of the Hebrew patriarch Avraham with exploits such as traveling around, pretending his 90-year-old wife is his sister, getting her pregnant, negotiating, pitching tents, and building shrines. Well, now we get to our first war of the Bible, an incredible victory by the very same Avraham. This comes at the tail end of a regional conflict between four major kings of Mesopotamia and five local Canaanite kings. After the Mesopotamian kings roundly defeat their Canaanite foes, Avraham and his posse follow the victors up north to the area of Damascus where they carry out a night raid, free Abraham's brother Lot and bring back the spoils taken from the Canaanites. And Abraham doesn't even want to get paid for his troubles, but he makes sure his peeps get their dues. So we're going back a bit in the biblical narrative to Genesis chapter 14 before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and before the death of Sarah. In this episode, we'll explore the history and myth behind this war and see what we can learn about the geopolitical situation in ancient Mesopotamia and the ancient Near East between the 14th and the 20th centuries BCE. Let's dive in. Hi, Omri. Hi, Gil. Before we move on, I want to give a massive shout out to a new member of the show, Senai Iman. Hi, Senai. Thanks very much. Okay, so what do you make of this story? of this chapter about this war so there's no real archaeological findings that can corroborate the story the names are sort of like of the kings the, of the kings the name of the babylonian king, the foreign kings are <laughs> names that sort of like generic names it is believed generic names that represent uh, the area that they ca- came from I mean, and there are generic names of these sort of kings from this city or that city. If you imagine uh, yeah. a story about uh, a war between Russia and Poland and Germany, so the king of Russia is Vladimir and yes. the king of Germany is Hans. The yes. king of uh, Poland is something, something ski. So it's not an historical event, but, but, but the fact that they took great care to put this event inside of the gr- grand or mediocre <laughs> epoch <laughs> of uh, Abraham. Yes, the means, most important person. Yeah. So it, it tells us that maybe there's some kind of an archaeological remnant, some Ar- kind of a, me- <laughs> of a memory remnant. of some sort of an event that took place that uh, you couldn't really not tell about it. Or when you did tell about it, then your main character, Abraham, is not that powerful, so it just takes vengeance after the fact. The event was strong enough to prevent manipulation by later mm-hmm. writers. Yes. They, the, they yes. couldn't claim a victory in the name of Abraham because the memory was, so, was stronger of, yes, of and, the defeat. And, and also that the, the powers that be, they were never local. They were always from the east yeah. and from the north, the Hittites. This is also interesting because we have a glimpse of ancient, ancient history, geopolitical situation. Yeah, how do they go about uh, war and who? Yeah. Why are they fighting against them? The four kings are uh, their alliance that uh, was created by the king of Shinar, <laughs> Shinal, <laughs> which Shinal. is like ancient a city know. state in Bavelo or Babylonia and uh, Babylonia itself. Yeah, and they were, the, the Egyptians uh, called them Sungal and the Hittites called them. Shanhal. Yeah. The way it's described is that the local kings were supposed to pay taxes or tribute or kneel, whatever. Just like they were vassals yeah. to the big kings. Yeah. And when they Mardubaim rebelled against them, then they came in to crush the rebellion. Yeah. You don't have like the army of the Elamites stationed there in yeah. Canaan, Canaan. Yeah. So, so you, you, you're, you're not paying? Okay, we're sending our armies yeah. from all these cities. And we'll make an alliance with other cities. Yes. So the political situation here is like proto-empirical, proto-empire. And post-empire also. The Mesopotamian the... sphere was not as united as it was years later. And years before. But also. it still took... A no, but be- before the, the Bronze Age collapse, you also had uh, something else. Yes. The way that this is phrased in the book, it looks in the genre 
of king tablets. Mm -hmm. When they say in the days of this and this king, here is what we did. Yeah. We came here, we fought this. So this is written like a tablet or something. Like an historical document. Yes, yes. It's written like a historical document. Yeah, to the, the local, to the contemporary listener. Yes. It sounds like uh, it, ah. it is taken from a history book. Yes, it's legit. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds Quote legit. Quote unquote history book. Yeah. Uh, so for us, uh, like uh, what popped into my mind, it's like the introduction to Star Wars. I, I don't know if we uh, can uh, do the music uh, if it's copyrighted if I do it <laughs> and you see the text coming about they want to recognize your version don't they <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> so this is like uh, so different from the chapters that are coming up the one that we did uh, previously about the binding of uh, its hack yeah If you translate it to a movie, then imagine you seen uh, Avengers and the first scene, it looks and sounds like Avengers Ultron or whatever that you already seen. And then uh, in the second act, the entire style of the movie changes. It's, it becomes black and white, uh, one shot, uh, less dialogues. Yes. <coughs> and then emotional connections yeah and the main character walks into another room and <laughs> the minute that he's crossing the room the film is suddenly in a different film altogether <laughs> it, it sounds and looks <laughs> like a Bollywood movie like a Bollywood movie <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, they go outside and outside it's the Avengers that you saw <laughs> two uh, scenes ago <laughs> this is how it looks for us it's like it, it's uh, it's shouting <laughs> from the text shouting from the text yeah th th this, this is, is totally different this is not like this this is not like this So you were talking about the generic names of the four big uh, kings of uh, Mesopotamia and uh, yeah. the like, that they are like generic names of this and that uh, region and city, yeah. whatever. They don't want it to be a specific, uh, a specific king. It's, It's irrelevant. Like, yeah. Irrelevant. It's irrelevant. The five kings, the local Canaanites and the Canaanites, they are the ones that are more important for the writers and the listeners. Their names are also generic in a very silly way they're not generic it's like dr evil <laughs> <laughs> they are very revealing <laughs> very revealing like so you have bera king of sdom bera it it's means in evil in evil king of sdom then berosha berasha melchamora in, in evilness <laughs> <laughs> maybe yeah maybe bera is more like bad yeah king of sdom and here evil in evil king of amora Shinav, king of Adama, I don't know, uh, and uh, the next one, I don't know what it means. And then again, Umelech Bela. Bela. So Bela is like vile, something uh, like really yeah. bad. Divrei yeah. Bela, like words of Bela, it's like hateful words. You have Malki Tzedek, which literally means righteous king. Yeah, king. King, of, king, <laughs> king, king. king of righteousness. Yes. Malki, it's like a king of. So this is like the first time, this is like when this trick first... King uh, of justice, was maybe. King of justice. This is like where, where this trick was first invented. Somebody, I can imagine, and came up with it. Oh, I can give the, the, the guys that I don't like and give them an evil name. Yes. Woo, high five! <laughs> and then all the audience, they were like, isn't it a huge coincidence that that guy was... <laughs> evil and his name was also <laughs> mr evil <laughs> but then the smart people in the audience said, wow do you see how they made us understand that they are evil without telling us that they are doing some evil stuff they just put it in their name it's incredible and then it's the, genius. Sm the smarter people will say <laughs> why are they doing that and he gets stoned so he, we, we lost genius. him we lost <laughs> him in the evolution Oh my goodness, be, be this guy, yeah. he was the guy, <laughs> <laughs> be that. Do you want to describe uh, the, the two battles? First, the battle of Sidim, it calls it, in uh, the, uh, the valley of Sidim. What I, okay, so the king, the losing kings, they run away, they fall into holes yeah. with uh, Pit, uh, pits with uh, tar. With tar. Yeah. It's like, okay, so they're humiliated. Yeah. I guess this is a, a forever, for, <laughs> this has always been humiliating. And then after they win, they take spoils of war, they take a lot of hostages. They go up One north. One of them is the Luigi, brother of uh, Abraham, Abraham Mario. Yeah. 
And then how does uh, Abraham uh, learn of this? One person uh, flees, yeah. and then they tell you, he comes from a clan that, is, uh, that has a pact with Abraham. So that detail kind of stood out to me because this is another one of those Genesis very economical stories. Yeah. Every word there has been placed for a reason. And I was like, was this supposed to tell us that he knew Abraham from beforehand? Okay. What does it tell us about the world? Nothing. But then I was thinking maybe it was to contrast the two existing political systems at the time. You have clans yeah. who agree on a pact. Yeah. They have an agreement, like consensual and equal and respectful. While the city-state and the empire, the violence is inherent in the system. If you don't pay, they come and kick your ass and take your stuff. Yeah. So this is maybe another example uh, of the point of view of the pastoralists that is very apparent in uh, Genesis. Yeah. Anyway, so what happens next is that uh, Abraham takes 318 or something like that uh, number and then they conduct a night raid, which semi-nomadic uh, kinds of people in that area, raids yeah. were something that they often did. Yeah, it was the mod modus operandi usually. Yeah, so this is it. It makes sense also yeah. for it's not like he's doing, you know, a siege. It's it's supremely non-heroic. We don't know anything that he's doing himself. It's just so it's like if you just contrast co that yeah. to just other heroic, a kind of a raid expedition, not even uh, armies, because the Bible doesn't shy of exaggerating numbers. They could have said it took. Uh, 10,000 mm. men. So maybe they exaggerated the, like the David versus Goliath uh, yeah, thing. Maybe. We are small maybe. and this is only 300 people. He beat that army, but over there near, the, near Damascus. There's Damascus. a lot of a uh, point of view of the weak here. Uh, a lot of Bible stories are from the, we said it over and over again, uh, the point of view of people who usually lose, uh, who usually don't hold the great riches, don't have vast armies. They don't have vast territories. They don't have large empires. This is the, the stories are from the point of view of people who usually lose. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a great... Uh, th so this is like yeah. Israel beating France in 1993 in yeah. the World Cup qualifiers at the yeah. 90th minute. Yeah. And we, weren't, we weren't better than them, yeah. but we squeaked in a goal at the final minute. We weren't better than them. And for us, it was a meaningless game because yes. we, it didn't improve our chances <laughs> to qualify <laughs> a bit. But we screwed them but over. But we screwed the French, then. <laughs> and the Semites. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we won big on the 90th minute in the wow. on foreign grounds. So for us... <laughs> and there, back there... We are, still... We still remember yeah. this epic tale yes. of uh, yes. uh, Rosenthal and uh, <laughs> Ruben Attar and, Attar and, Attar? The, and <laughs> Ruben Attar and the announcer, the the guy who yeah. the commentators of the game. He wow. screams, they almost are, crying. Yeah, kind of crying. Kind and, of crying. And the, his his partner telling him, "Relax, mayor, Let's relax." For you, but we. We tell you that and it means nothing to you. Wow, I get goosebumps. <laughs> Nobody remembers that game. Even the French, they remember more the next game that they lost also the 90th minute yeah, in Bulgaria. In Bulgaria. For the French people, that yes. game was part of some kind of a yeah. stain on the history yes. of their football that yes. they didn't even qualify to yeah. the World Cup of 94 and the generation that yes. was there with the corruption in Marseille yeah. and stuff like that. And for us, Hang on, we still remember it. <laughs> and because they won the following World Cup, the following and World then Cup, yeah. uh, a couple of years ago, won again. So for yeah. them, this is like, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. It's a really, it's so a really it's good like, analogy. Kind of like that. <laughs>
To get the entire episode and all our content, look for a podcast of Biblical Proportions on all podcasting platforms.